Ecclesiastes chapter number 7. Ecclesiastes chapter number 7. And we left off last time at uh, Ecclesiastes 7. We went over verse 10. Say not thou... What is the cause that the former days were better than these? For thou dost not inquire wisely concerning this. Wisdom is good with an inheritance, and by it there is profit to them that see the sun. The reason why wisdom is good with an inheritance, because you leave your kids or grandkids or whoever an inheritance, if they don't have any wisdom, uh, that inheritance will be gone very quickly, and there will be nothing to show for it yeah. but a bunch of stupid junk, if there's anything, if there's even stupid junk. Amen? Yeah. And uh, so you got to uh, instill some wisdom about these things. Receiving an inheritance can be a great blessing, but also a burden, too, if the person receiving the inheritance is a fool. Without wisdom, money can destroy a person. The prodigal son was a fool, and the inheritance he demanded from his father ruined his life because he was ruled by lust and not by wisdom. And uh, his lack of wisdom caused him to waste his wealth away, leaving him with nothing but the shirt on his back. I told you this before, that uh, I read years ago, Mike Tyson, he was a heavyweight boxer, and uh, Mike Tyson, uh, he... Uh, he went through over a hundred million dollars in about five or six years. <clears throat> and there's various reasons, various ways he went through the money, which I won't go into. But uh, he, uh, uh, that that is what you call that isn't even an inheritance. That's not an inheritance. That's just winning millions of dollars because he could knock people out. And he was a great boxer. He was a great boxer. He I mean, destroyed people. And uh, but. Uh, he, did, he didn't have a lick of sense. And uh, he told one guy one time he's going to eat his heart. I told him, my dad, I'm going to eat your heart. And uh, he's just crazy. He says, he'd get in the boxing ring, man. He, within a couple of rounds, he'd knock his brains out, man. He just, you know, so uh, if you don't have any wisdom, uh, they waste the wealth away, leaving them nothing but the shirt on their back. And uh, they got to be a good steward. And uh, people turn to a variety of things. I believe we left off this uh, with this last time. People turn to a variety of things to defend themselves, including guns and knives, self-defense training, zappers, pepper spray, bodyguards, to name a few. Rarely, however, will people say they are depending on wisdom to defend themselves. So where's that at? Well, right here in the verses. Verse 12, for wisdom is a defense, and money is a defense. The wisdom and money are defenses. Uh, money and wisdom can help to protect your life. How does that happen? Money can help you purchase things to protect or help you physically, but wisdom provides protection or acts as a shield, too, that can strengthen you physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Wisdom has much more uh, has much more powerful effect in your life than money. That's why it should be pursued and prized by uh, us more than money. Wisdom comes from God, and we are to ask God for wisdom, and it's free. You don't have to pay for it. Uh, James one five: If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not. Upbraideth not means God isn't stingy about it. He doesn't upbraid. It's not a thing, well, I guess I'll give you some wisdom if you ask me, but I don't want to give you much. It's not upbraid. Upbraid if not, it shall be given him. Uh, how much better is it to get wisdom than gold? Proverbs 16, 16. Happy is the man that findeth wisdom. Proverbs 3, 13. Wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom. Proverbs 4, 7. Proverbs 8, 11. For wisdom is better than rubies, and all the things that may be desired are not to be compared to it. Proverbs is filled with the three words, knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. Knowledge is the fact that you know a lot of stuff. 
lot of people know a lot of things. They're like an inf they're like an information machine. Uh, they, they have a lot of knowledge about a lot of different things. All right. Uh, wisdom is how to use that knowledge. Understanding is how to use that wisdom as it pertains to God. When the Bible says in Romans 3 and Psalms 53, there is none that understandeth. It doesn't mean nobody understands geometry. It doesn't mean that nobody understands what 5 plus 5 is. It doesn't mean God isn't saying that nobody understands chemistry. When he says there is none that understandeth, he's saying there is none that understands, there is none that seeketh after God. We, we, in our natural, unsaved, depraved condition, we don't understand who God is, our, how our sin offends an almighty, righteous, sin, sinless God, and we don't understand that to, we don't understand what our sin can do to us uh, by rejecting Christ or as Christians get involved in sin, what it can do to a person's life. That's what he means. He's talking about there is none that understandeth, there's none that understands spiritual things. We, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. 1 Corinthians 2.14 So, uh, wisdom helps you avoid foolish choices as well as foolish people. Money can end up making a fool out of you. Wisdom helps us to see life from God's perspective. When we go through trials, wisdom enables us to learn what God is trying to teach us and guard against depression, discouragement, or doubt. Wisdom helps you to learn from your own mistakes as well as the mistakes that others make. And one of the best ways to learn is by watching other people. To watch how they succeed and how they fail. Uh, money or the greed for money can cause you to make terrible mistakes. Uh, wisdom gives discernment in making the right decisions. It helps you to know when to move forward or to stay put. It helps you to know the difference between a good choice and the best choice. Someone said, Wisdom is the God-given ability to see life with rare objectivity and to handle life with rare stability. On the other hand, money can rob you of common sense and lead to destructive decisions. Uh, wisdom helps you to be patient and not be careless. Money can make you impatient and reckless. Wisdom helps you to keep your focus on God and maintain the right priorities. Money can cause you to get your focus on yourself and worldly living. Wisdom helps you to know when to speak up or when to shut up. The benefits of wisdom help to preserve the life of the person who possess it, especially when that wisdom is anchored in Jesus Christ, who is the wisdom of God. Jesus Christ is the wisdom of God, according to 1 Corinthians 1, verse 24, and 1 Corinthians 1.30. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1.30 says that the Lord is our, is our sanctification, redemption, and wisdom. Uh, a man had built a successful business, and uh, through honesty and hard work, as he grew older, he was concerned about the future of his business because he had no close relatives except three nephews. <coughs> three nephews. He summoned these three young men and told them he had a problem, and whoever came up with the best solution would inherit his wealth. He gave them all an equal sum of money and told them to buy something that would fill his large office. Buy something that will fill the large office. They could not spend more than what was given them, and they had to return by sunset. The three worked on their mission all day, and as the curtain... Uh, curtains began to close on the sun, they returned to report to their uncle. The first dragged in a huge bale of straw into the room, and when it was untied, it nearly hid two of the walls. It hid two of the walls. The second brought in two large bags of thistle down, which filled three-fourths of the room when it was released. The third nephew stood silent and forlorn. He told his uncle that he spent half of the money to feed a hungry child that day and gave almost the rest to the church. With the little that remained, he purchased some matches and a small candle 
when he lit the wick, the light filled the room. The old man realized that he was the noblest of them all and made the best use of his gift. He received the inheritance of the old man because he made wise use of what he what he had had and what and gave a good accounting of it. All right, uh, Ecclesiastes seven verse eleven: Wisdom is good with an inheritance, and by it there is profit to them that see the sun. Verse twelve: For wisdom is a defense, and money is a defense, but the ex ex excellency of knowledge is that wisdom giveth life to them that have it. See, wisdom will give you life if you got it. Not only eternal life, because if you got wisdom, the, the, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So you have wisdom, you'll fear God, you'll get saved, and then you'll serve God, because you know what wisdom, you're wise about things. You'll know that serving God is the most important thing in, in a person's life. Putting God first. Verse 12, or 13. Verse 13, consider the work of God. For who can make that straight which he hath made crooked? All right, a lot to say on the first five words. Consider the work of God. If you desire to gain wisdom in your life, then consider carefully the work of God. Now, this is not a suggestion, it's a command. It says, consider the work of God, verse 13. Consider what he has done in the past as well as in the present future. The word consider here, it's not a word of casualness, but of intensity. It means to inspect, to learn about, to give your attention to something, to, get, to gaze at something. We're to focus our attention on what God has done and what He is doing. Consider the work of God. Uh, Psalms 139, 14, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. Uh, Psalms 9, 91 verse 1, I will praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will show forth all thy marvelous works. Consider the work of God. This world and mankind are the work of the master creator, the Lord God Almighty. We do not exist by chance. Sir Isaac Newton put it this way. He said the most elegant system of suns and planets could only rise for the purpose and sovereignty of an intelligent and mighty being. He rules them all as the sovereign lord of all things, unquote. The famous rocket scientist, Werner von Braun, said, quote, One cannot be exposed to the law and order of the universe without concluding that there must be design and purpose behind it all. Through a closer look at the creation, we ought to get a better knowledge of our Creator. Our Creator. Uh, to believe that we exist by mere chance would be like taking the parts of a typewriter, placing them in a washing machine, turn on the washer, and wait until the typewriter was fully put together. Hmm. To believe in chance would be like throwing scrap metal into the wind in order to build a car. Such beliefs are absurd. When you look at the design and the variety of the creatures in this world, each one confirms in unison the hand that made me is divine. Yeah. Now, let me give you several things about this. Consider the work of God. I mean, I mean, consider the complexity of God's work. You're, this is going to blow your mind. William McDonald points out that your DNA, you know, God made your body, DNA, your DNA contains the blueprint for your body. This molecule is so, so minute, yet it contains volumes of information about you. If all the information could be unwound and then spliced together, the thread would reach all the way to the sun and then back again, not once, not twice, but 400 times. Your DNA is located in your genes. If it was unwound, your genes would fit into a block no bigger than a cube of ice. The information about you that is stored in your DNA would fill an average home library of 100 volumes. This did not happen by chance. The astronomer from Britain and skeptic Sir Fred Hoyle said, quote, For the first cell to be originated by chance, 
was like saying that a tornado could sweep through an airplane junkyard and assemble a giant jet. <laughs> what is even more amazing is the fact that out of billions of people, no two people are exactly alike. DNA. Tell me there's no God. There's nobody in the world like you. You are one of a kind. That makes you pretty special. Amen? When you study the human eye, you see the complexity of God's work also. Consider the work of God. Ecclesiastes 7, 13. Consider the work of God. Well, we're going to consider it here for a few minutes. Consider that. Study the human eye. You see the complexity of God's work. The eye is a still camera. A movie camera as well as a light meter all wrapped up in one. The eye has automatic focusing, a zoom lens, a wide angle lens, and sees images in color. The ear also reveals the complexity of God's work. It has a unique filtering system for sound. For example, a mother can sleep through the snoring of her husband or a barking dog outside. Yet she awakens immediately when her baby cries in the next room. The complexity of the human brain leaves a scientist baffled. Uh, it's so complex that no computer will ever be able to do what the brain does for a person. The author Edmund Bowles, B-O-L-L-E-S, Bowles, Bowles, called the brain the most complicated structure in the known universe. God made your brain. Amen. The information that can be stored in the brain is mammoth. It has been estimated that the information in the brain can fill 20 million volumes. You say, well, some people sure don't act like a preacher. They don't use their brain. They don't use it. They don't try to study. They don't try to, you know. One scientist estimated that our brain on the average processes over 10,000 thoughts and concepts each day. Some can even do more than that. Consider the complexity of the work of God. Then consider not only the complexity of God's work, consider the durability of God's work. Listen to this about a little baby. Four weeks after a baby is conceived, the heart begins to beat and continues to do this for a lifetime. It pumps blood 100,000 times a day and continues to do this as long as 100 or more years for some people. The average person lives to be 70 to 85 and through there. Some live to be 90 or 100, but say 100 years. All right, that, that, think your heart is beating right now. All right? It's only the size of a fist. Your heart is the size of that right there. That's the size of a heart. Your heart. Right here. In there. It's beating. I mean, it beats when you're sleeping. It don't ever stop, thank God. But one of these days, it will stop. <laughs> I hate to alarm you, but one of these days, it will stop. When God says stop, amen? Yeah. Uh, so it's only the size of a fist, yet the heart pumps five quarters of blood a minute. This enables oxygen to be distributed to the cells and waste in the body to be carried away. The temperature of the body is also regulated. In a 70-year period, a 70-year lifetime, three score and ten average, the heart beats 2.3 billion times. 2.3 billion in a 70-year life. You say, well, I'm older than 70. Well, it's, it's been beaten more than that then. Consider the durability of the work of God. And then consider the orderliness, orderliness or preciseness of God's work. Any baby that's born is a miracle. You started out as a fertilized egg about the size of the dot in the small letter I. 
contained in that little dot were the genetic codes that would determine what you would become, including the color of your eyes, your skin, and your hair, your height, sex, voice, body features, and appearance were also contained in that dot. What is amazing is how you grew in your mother's womb. The cells in your body were orchestrated by God. The cells knew where to go and what features to form. The kidney cells knew where to go and started multiplying, forming your kidneys. The lung cells multiplied right in the exact place where the lungs should be in your body. They did not form in your feet, they formed in your chest where they're supposed to be. This holds true for the heart, liver, stomach, intestines, the veins, arteries, brain, etc. We're talking about the orderliness or preciseness of God's work. There's a lot in this five words, consider the work of God. And we'd be here all night. These features not only knew where to go, but also when to form. It is incredible that this takes place and is ample proof that there is a master designer that has organized in an orderly fashion this creation process. And yet people say there's no God and that we evolve from monkeys. Mm. Speak for themselves. I didn't evolve from a monkey, amen? <laughs> Your body parts and organs formed at the right time because that was God's design in your creation and development. The multiplication of these cells, the positioning in the body, and the timing of their development all work together to produce a heart that beats in four weeks, a brain in three months, as far as this little baby, and a developed baby in nine months. Consider the orderliness and preciseness of God's work. The preciseness of God's work is seen in the creation of Earth. This planet is exactly the right distance from the sun. It is 93 million miles away from it. If this planet was more in distance or less in its distance from the sun, life could not survive on this planet. Not only the distance is precise, but the size of our world is just right. If it was different, the atmospheric blanket that covers our world would be either too thin or too dense. Nothing would be able to survive. Even the tilt of the earth on its axis is perfect. What a God we serve. Amen. Amen. We ought to take a 15-minute recess and just run around the building and praise God. <laughs> the tilt helps to form the four seasons in most places of the world. I like it. I like the four seasons. Not too crazy about the winter, but I like spring, summer, and fall. Amen? But thank God for the winter, too, I guess. The God, it, winter's part of God's plan, too. Amen? It makes the cultivation of the planet possible. Without it, the planet would be barren like the desert. The way that the tilt helps the four seasons. The rotation speed is also precise. It is the precise speed as it orbits around the sun, spinning on its axis. This enables the warmth of the sun to be dispersed in a uniform manner and to generate wind and ocean currents. There's no way this all happened by chance. Yeah. Right. We serve a great big God. Amen. And this God that did all this stuff that I've been talking about the last several minutes, he made you and knows all about you. Amen. Isn't that something? Amen. Stuart E. Nevins is the assistant professor of geology at Christian Heritage College, San Diego, California. He commented on the foolishness of believing that this world and universe just blob together in an orderly fashion. He illustrated this by saying, quote, it is akin to supposing that the Mona Lisa came into existence from globs of paint being hurled at a canvas. Consider the price, preciseness of God's work. All right, then going on, Ecclesiastes 7, 13. Consider the work of God, for who can make that straight which he hath made crooked? All right, now, uh, 
Solomon offered a question about our abilities compared to God's abilities. Who can make that straight which he, God, hath made crooked? If you know anything about possessing something that has been bent, you know it's difficult to restore to its original straight condition. That's the point Solomon was making. This question is a form of counsel to all of us to accept God's will and his way. Doing so will help you to gain wisdom in your life. Uh, we might as well do this because God is God and does as he wills for our own good and benefit, even when his will may be painful and troublesome for us. Uh, if there is difficulty in our lives, the Lord allows it for a purpose. In 1934, Reinhold Niebuhr, N-I-E-B-U-H-R, he penned, and some of you have got this in your house probably, he penned the serenity prayer which deals with the issue of acceptance of life circumstances. Oh God, give us serenity to accept what cannot be changed, courage to change what should be changed, and wisdom to distinguish the one from the other. That is when you're growing in grace and knowledge of the Lord. Paul said, I, not that I speak in respect of what I have learned and whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. Philippians 4.11 I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Philippians 4.13, as I've said many times, Philippians is a prison epistle. You realize some of the things he said? Not that I speak in respect. He's sitting in prison when he writes it. So is Ephesians. They're prison epistles. You know what he says in Philippians 4.11? Not that I speak in respect of want. Well, if I was sitting in prison, I could think of a lot of wants. One thing I want to get out of here. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. That's high spiritual ground. Philippians 4.13, 4, Philippians 4, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Philippians 4.13. Philippians 4.19, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. One of the main themes of uh, Philippians is suffering. And uh, sometimes events in our lives get crooked, causing us to worry or despair. Crooked events may include a broken heart, severe sickness, depression, severed or strained relationships, betrayal, sorrow, death, false accusations, rejection, financial setbacks, uh, the paralysis from problems and fear may rob you of any possibility of pleasure in your life. Uh, everyone faces crooked or difficult paths in their life. Some do have more crooked paths and difficult things than others, it seems. I don't understand all that either. No one is exempt from trouble and trials. A lot of times people go through things because of bad decisions, unwise decisions. God allows them into our lives for a reason. Dr. We uh, Wearsby said about this matter, he said, God balances our lives by giving us enough blessings to keep us happy and enough burdens to keep us humble. He balances the blessings in our hands with the burdens on our backs. Uh, Jesus invited us to get under his yoke and to trust his plan and his will for our lives. Come unto me, all you that labor heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Come unto me, all you that labor heavy laden. Labor and heavy laden describe a person that's weary, uh, exhausted, loaded down with burdens. Uh, The, come unto me, all you that labor heavy late, and I'll give you rest. Uh, the word rest means to cease from labor in order to recover and collect your strength, to refresh, to enjoy calm, peace, and rest with patient expectation and hope. Come unto me, all that labor heavy late, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you, <coughs> Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 to 30. Take my yoke upon you and learn... He wants us to take his yoke upon us and learn of him. 
All right. What is a yoke? A yoke is a cross bar that is used to link horses, mules, or oxen together to pull a plow or load. It can also include a harness and a bit that are placed in the mouth of the animal pulling the load. The key idea of the yoke is service. That's what the animal does. Service. If you're going to serve the Lord, then you need to be yoked to Him. In so doing, you'll learn from Him and get close to Him. The problem with a lot of churches today is they're looking for a harvest, but not the harness. They want a big harvest, but they don't, they're not in the harness, the yoke. A lot of Christians don't want to get their hands dirty or have their comfort zone squeezed or shaken. The harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. The ones that get their hands dirty, they're few. Now, what does it mean to be yoked with Christ? When we look at the purpose of the yoke or harness, we find out we can accept and yield to God's will for us. There are several things about the yoke. First of all, the yoke is for discipline. The yoke is for discipline. Mules, a mule has a wild nature that has to be brought under control if they're going to plow a field or pull a load. The harness helps to bring the animal under the control of the master. It is placed on the head of the animal and a bit is placed in the mouth. In the same manner, if we're going to yield to the Lord in serving, we need to bring our fleshly nature under God's harness or yoke. We need to get our head on our, or our attitude right about God and about ourselves and about others. We also need to get our tongue under His control. Self-control is a vital element of surrender. James 1.26, If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. So the yoke is for discipline. The second D is the yoke is for direction. The yoke is for discipline and the yoke is for direction. The harness helps the animals to know the directions or the will of their master. The master's tug on the reins of the mule will give direction on whether to turn, stop, or to go. Getting under the yoke of Christ will help us to know the Lord's will for our lives. He'll guide and direct us if we'll let him and submit to the tug of the Holy Spirit. Psalms 32.8 I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. John 16, 13, Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he'll guide you into all truth. I'm glad that the Lord, the Holy Spirit, will guide us into all truth. The problem is a lot of folks don't want truth. If a person wants truth, God will show them truth and give them truth. And the truth is what makes you free. John 8, 32, if the, And you shall know the truth, the truth shall make you free. If the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. John 8, 36, people talk about being free. You get free through, uh, out of bondage by obeying the truth and getting saved and accepting God's will and direction as a vital part of finding rest and peace in your life. Telling the Lord how great He is and how much you love Him will be a joke if you're unwilling to do what He directs you to do. Uh, I might have used this illustration before, I don't know, but J. Wilbur Chapman, when he was in London, England back in the 1800s, he had an opportunity to meet General William Booth of the Salvation Army, who at that time was past 80 years of age. Dr. Chapman listened reverently as the old general spoke of the trials, the conflicts, and the victories that he had, he had experienced. The American evangelist J. Wilbur Chapman then asked the General William Booth, if he would disclose his secret for success. He hesitated a second, Chapman said, and then I saw the tears come into his eyes and steal down his cheeks. Then he said, this is, this is uh, General William Booth said this, he said, I'll tell you the secret. God has had all there was of me. There have been men with greater brains than I, Men with greater opportunities than I. But from the day that I got the poor of London on my heart, London, England, poor of London on my heart, and a vision of what Jesus Christ could do with the poor of London, 
I made up my mind that he would have all of William Booth there was. And if there is anything of power in the Salvation Army today, it's because God has all the adoration of my heart, all the power of my will, all the influence of my life. You say, preacher, the Salvation Army isn't what it used to be. A lot of churches aren't what they used to be. Right. I, I, but I have noticed that God keeps that Salvation Army going. I seen the other day, uh, or maybe the last year, around Christmas time, when they had the kettle buckets and stuff out in stores and stuff. And uh, somebody in Minnesota or somewhere... They wrote out a hundred thousand dollar check for Salvation Army. Some billionaire up there or something. I don't know somehow people just seem to keep giving to that Salvation Army. General William Booth. Dr. Chapman said he went away from that meeting with General Booth knowing that the greatness of a man or woman's power is the measure of their surrender. The greatness of your power will be in the measure of your surrender. Some measure, some people's measure of surrender to God is a little bit. Some a little more. Some a little more. Some a little more. Some a little more. It's different with each individual. Each individual, individual Christian. Like Dr. Green said, Brother Steve, he told me this years ago, Brother Steve, he just died here recently, almost 94 years old, preached for 70 years. 70, well, he started preaching in 46. 1946, and he died this year. He gave the church up about five, his son Jimmy took the church. He died, in fifth, or he took, gave the church up in 15. So let's see, 54. Preached about 70 years. Same, preached the same, pastor the same church for 60 years, 1955 to 2015. He said, Brother Steve, he told me this to my face years ago. He said, I've learned that most people have about as much God as they want. You say, who said that? A 16-year-old teenage boy? Ha <laughs> ha No. A man who's been preaching for years and years and years and dealt with many, 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 many different people. And has preached all over the country for many, many, many years, too. I mean, he preached all over. He had beans about every week. He said, how do you pastor his church? His son, Steve, who's been in heaven for several years, he outlived two of his kids. Mary died of cancer several years ago, and Steve died. Because Steve's his right hand man. I like little Steve. See him down there at Sammy Allen's many times. Dr. Green preached his kids' funerals, two of his kids' funerals. He said, Brother Steve, I've learned through the years. Just said it real nonchalantly, didn't blink an eyeball. He said, think about America when I say this. People have about as much God as they want. So, uh, the yoke is for discipline, it's for direction. The yoke is for, third D, determination. The yoke is for determination. There are times when a plow team hits a rough patch of soil. It may have rocks in it, making plowing difficult. The yoke on the animals under the commander of the master keeps them going forward and not giving up in spite of the difficult terrain. Hey, folks, let's keep going forward in spite of the difficult terrain. Amen. In the same manner, the yoke of Christ helps us to not give up when our circumstances get difficult. Job worshipped God because he was determined to do so. He refused to give up on God and let his trials defeat him because he was getting strength from the Lord. Determination is an important element of accepting the work and the will of God. You've got to have determination. I'm going to serve God. 
I'm going to be faithful to God. I'm going to be obedient to God, especially in this wicked, filthy, ungodly age that we live in. A determined attitude to surrender to Him will help immensely in combating waywardness and willfulness. Number four, the yoke. By the way, Dr. Green said people have about as much God as they want. You can have as much God as you want. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. James 4, 8. But a lot of people just choose to kind of stay a little, stay far away from the Lord. You know, I, I, I know you get tired of me saying it, but Dr. Homer Smith used to say, a lot of people, they like grill cream religion. A little dab will do you. A little dab. I'm not perfect. i got a long ways to go, believe me. But when I got saved 45 years ago, June 16, 1977, I dove in. I immediately started memorizing Scripture. And within a few months, God called me to preach. Just went right at me. I never, I, before I got saved, I hate to say it, before I went saved, before I got saved, I went all wild for the devil. And buddy, when I got saved, I went for Jesus. Amen. Amen. I never have been one that is kind of tiptoe tip through the tulips. And, you know, all the, I see people sometimes in these swimming pools and these uh, out in the lakes and different places they swim and stuff. I see them sometimes, they'll get out there and they'll get their toes in the water, they'll test the waters. You say, that's mostly women. No, I see men do it too. They'll test the waters for a half, for a half an hour or 45 minutes. They'll get their toes in there and go, ooh, it's cold. I just dive in. Just dive in. Amen. Dive in for Jesus. You know what God said to that Laodicean church? You're lukewarm. He said, you make me sick. <clears throat> Spew thee out of my mouth. The yoke distributed the load. The yoke or harness helps to distribute the load over the entire body of the animal, enabling it to do greater work or pull heavier loads. When we are yoked up with the Lord, He helps us to bear our burdens and heavy loads too. His yoke is easy and His load is light. Bearing the yoke of the Lord enables us to trust and serve Him in times of woe and when our burdens are heavy. Psalm 62, 8. Trust in him at all times, ye people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Then fifthly, the fifth D, the yoke eliminates distractions. The yoke eliminates distractions. Harnesses have blinders attached to them to eliminate distractions for the animal. They enable the mule or the ox to keep his focus on what's straight ahead. Straight ahead of him instead of what's going on next to him. Over here. And over here. You know what the devil tries to get you to do? Tries to get your focus on all this world and the things of the world. The yoke of Christ helps us in our work for him because it helps us to keep our focus. Uh, on the Lord and the prize of his high calling to service. Christians get distracted by the faults of other believers or the unfaithfulness of other believers or by intense trials or the cares of this world. When this happens, their devotion to God is affected and they begin to entertain doubts about God's care and their will, God's will for their lives. Uh, being yoked up with the Lord will help us stay focused on Him. The late Dr. Peter Marshall once selected for use in a church service the familiar hymn of consecration. This is what he chose as a hymn uh, the church service. Take my life and let it be. He requested the congregation to give particular thought to the words Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. 
exacting the practical sense of the words, not a mite would I withhold, he asked this. He asked that all who could not sing this line with literal sincerity refrain from singing it at all. Don't sing it at all. You can't do it sincerely. You say, what is that? Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. The effect was a dramatic commentary on the glib, thoughtless manner in which all too often we sing our hymns. Hundreds of voices with organ accompaniment sang vigorously up to the designated point. Then suddenly there was only the sound of the organ music. Not a single voice ventured to so challenge a hype of that. In other words, they couldn't sing it. They stopped there. Because he said, if you can't sing that with sincerity, you really mean it. Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. How many people in America could really sing that with sincerity? Take my money, take my gold, take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold, nothing I'll withhold. Not many. And so the yoke eliminates distractions. <clears throat> And then uh, Ecclesiastes 7.14, going on. In the day of prosperity, be joyful. But in the day of adversity, consider. God also has set the one over against the other to the end that man should find nothing after him. All right. In the day of prosperity, verse 14, be joyful. But in the day of adversity, consider God also hath set the one over against the other to the end that man should, be, should find nothing after him. Wisdom is gained by understanding that adversity and prosperity are a part of life. That's what Solomon's saying here. We're talking about a man who had everything, remember? Remember I took you to 1 Kings chapters 10 and 11? And there's this Chronicles and Kings especially 1 Kings 10 and 11, and showed you everything this man had. He had 700 wives and 300 concubines. He was the richest man, rich. He had riches. He had houses. He had lands. He planted me, I planted me vineyards. I planted orchards. I had pools, all that. He went through it in Ecclesiastes chapters 1 and 2. He had everything. That most people are not, probably everybody, but most people in America won. You know what he said in Ecclesiastes 2, 17 and 18? Therefore, I hated life. You know why? Because this was a man that at one time was right with God and when he wrote Proverbs. Then he got away from God. And he's writing the consequences of getting away from God in the book of Ecclesiastes. He's a man under the sun. He's looking, that's why under the sun expression occurs many times in Ecclesiastes. All right? He's looking at it the way that in really... Uh, the natural man would look at things. That's why in Ecclesiastes 1.4, he says the earth abideth forever. The average unsaved person looks at this earth and thinks it's going to abide forever. But 2 Peter 3.10-14 says the earth is going to melt with fervent heat. See the difference? We went over that. Solomon urged us to rejoice when times are happy, good, and prosperous. God allows those wonderful times in our lives. He is the giver of joy and blessing. The wise person will realize this and praise God for his blessings and benefits. All right? Uh, why does the Lord allow adversity in our lives? There are several reasons. Trials develop a number of things in us. It, trials develop patience. James 1.3, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. See, because he says here in Ecclesiastes 7.14, the day of prosperity... Uh, be joyful, but in the day of adversity, consider. Adversity is going through trials, tribulations, testings. A uh, number of things that uh, adversity does. Patience, produces patience, and then there's possible future ministry. We go through trials, we're able to prove our faith in the Lord to ourselves and to others. God's able to demonstrate his power in your tri trials. There's production. Uh, you bear fruit. God's not satisfied with our growth, and neither should we. There's perfection or maturity. Job 23.10, But he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. The Lord uses uh, trials to develop maturity in your life. You'll find generally that the, as a general rule, there are exceptions, but 
the Christians that have gone through the more trials and tribulations are generally more patient, stable, solid, grounded in the Word, that type of thing, and uh, they got maturity about them. Then there's the peaceable fruit of righteousness. God used your trials to develop godliness in you. All right? Uh, let's see here. The rich farmer in Luke 12 retired to eat, drink, and be merry. He thought that this was the way he would enjoy his future. God, however, called him a fool because he neglected his eternal destination. And the condition of his soul. He died that very night. Tomorrow is not for certain for any of us. None of us. November 22nd, 1963 is a dark day in American history. President John F. Kennedy had gone to Texas to build political support and ended up being assassinated in Dallas, Texas. The late Nellie Conley was seated in front of the Kennedys on that fateful day, and she wrote about it in her book. The book, From Love Field, Our Final Hours with President John F. Kennedy. Her husband, John Conley, was the Texas governor at the time, so they rode in the limousine's two middle jump seats. She recalled hoping that Dallas would warmly receive the Kennedys and was so delighted by the enormous outpouring of cheering crowds. As they were finishing up their parade route through downtown Dallas, Nellie Conley couldn't contain her excitement. They were passing the school book depository in Dealey Plaza, Daly Plaza, and moving toward the Stemmons Freeway when Mrs. Conley turned around and said, Mr. President, you certainly can't say that Dallas doesn't love you. There was one man that didn't love him. He smiled broadly in response, and then a moment later, he was mortally wounded in the head. He was gone. Those may have been the final words that President Kennedy heard. So what words? Mr. President, you certainly can't say that Dallas doesn't love you. <coughs> they rushed him to the hospital and declared him dead at the hospital. I'm not trying to be mean or gross or insensitive, but they have eyewitness accounts. He got his brains blown out. Part of his head went flying behind the limousine. Deader than a doornail right there. The guy used a high-powered rifle. He didn't use a BB gun. Mrs. Conley's presumption was mistaken. For all of us, even for the President of the United States, life is filled with enormous uncertainty. You just never know. You never know. And then, uh, just got a couple minutes here. Uh, Ecclesiastes 7.15 All things have I seen in the days of my vanity. There is a just man that perisheth in his righteousness, and there is a wicked man that prolongeth his life in his wickedness. Now, just quickly here before we close. Solomon reflected upon his past experiences and memories about events or experiences that took place in his life or things that he witnessed about other people. He felt that he had seen just about everything, both good and bad, just and unjust, tragedies and triumphs. His look into the past enabled him to gain wisdom in his present. He had witnessed the prosperity of the wicked who seemed to get away with their wickedness. That can happen, but that is not the norm. Wicked living tends to lead to misery. The way of transgressors is hard, Proverbs says. Uh, Solomon also noted that people who were righteous, but their lives were cut short. Adversity and prosperity come to both the ungodly 
as well as those who are godly. I'll close with this. Those who are godly may die young, but will still enjoy the blessings of God throughout eternity. In the West Indies, true story, in the West Indies, there is a beautiful tree that grows along the beaches called the Manchinel tree. Manchinel. Manchinel. It has very beautiful fruit and a wonderful, fragrant, sweet smell. The fruit looks like greenish, yellowish crab apples. The taste is sweet at first, then it begins to get hot like pepper and swells up the throat with boils. If this fruit is swallowed, it can lead to certain death. It is a toxic tree and is considered the most dangerous tree in the world. Because of its poison, the Indians would dip the tips of their arrows into its juice or sap in order to poison their enemies when they were wounded by their arrows. This is why it's called the tree of death. Columbus called its fruit, Christopher Columbus, the apple of death. It is believed that Juan Ponce de Leon, the first explorer into Florida, was killed by this fruit. He was wounded by an arrow tipped with a sap and it killed him. The milky white sap will blister the skin if it touches it. If the tree is burned, it will cause blindness if the smoke reaches the eyes of a person. That's why you don't, ever, you don't, you don't even want to stand near it or under it, under it when it rains. The water dripping from the tree will blister your skin because it's like acid rain. Even the air around the tree is toxic and can make you sick. In fact, the natives mark the tree with a red, o, a red X, a red cross, to warn people about the tree. A red cross. It's interesting to note that nearby this tree grows a flower whose juice is the antidote for the poison of the mancanil tree. What a beautiful picture of the grace of God. Sin abounds and leads to death. The wage of sin is death. God's solution, however, is his gift, which is eternal life. The Christ who died on the cross is the solution for the toxicity of sin. In other words, there was a tree that will kill you, but next to it, or not far away, was a tree that will heal you. And I'll tell you what, sin abounded, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Amen. Thank God for the grace of God. Amen. It don't matter what a person's done. Paul killed people. Paul killed Christians before he got saved. God saved him and called him to preach that and wrote over half the New Testament. Talk about the grace of God. Isn't God a wonderful God? Amen. 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 All right.